Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. I hope you're strong, stay strong. We still have six and a half weeks to go. I know the spring break was not long enough to recharge, to regain hope, but here we are. I'm trying to get you to understand this film, this week's film, Bonnie and Clyde, within the context of the culture of the time, because it is like in many ways, a man and a woman, a film that has become remote from our own sensibility, our own way of imagining the representation of life. And without those coordinates, clearly there are two mistakes one can easily make. The first is to read the film literally, when in fact the style of the film, the music track, the editing, everything has to be taken into consideration at the same time because they influence each other. And the second mistake is to see the film as something that reflects the style of the 1960s. That is to say, well, the film looks strange to me. It looks a bit weird, but it must have been the 1960s to Coeur, where in fact, we have to understand that within the culture of the 1960s and the various movements that culminated in the youth revolution of 1968, this film wanted to be different and was different. Okay, so you have to understand that it was innovative by the standards of those times. In order to achieve that goal, I will start with a longish introduction I will talk a little bit about what I call here on the board the global counterculture to include within this label not just the counterculture associated with the hippie movement, uh, the human rights fights, the anti-war, anti-Vietnam war movements of the US, but also the cultural <coughs> revolutions that led to 1968, uh, episodes of 1968 and 69, because 1968 is the beginning of the youth revolution in France, then Germany, Italy, and by 1970 reaches Mexico, for example. So it's, it's a long 1968 uh, associated with some of the same issues and plans. Okay. And then I will take into consideration three films that pretty much represent those instances, those issues. I will go back to A Man and a Woman. We will talk and compare that to Bonnie and Clyde and to Tulane Blacktop, the films that we've seen during the last three weeks. And I've identified five threads five focal points that we can use to understand how those films reflect the cultural climate of the time. So I've already said why global counterculture, meaning not just the American counter counterculture. And what are, if we want, of course, to simplify this complex uh, set of social movements what are some of the commonalities. And it's easier to understand the youth revolution of 1968 and counterculture of the 1960s by identifying their negative idols, the things they rebelled against, the things they didn't want, in terms of a proposition, in terms of an alternative plan, 
then we would have to diversify by area and by period. So we'll stay within the uh, points that can be easily identified. So in terms of negation, global counterculture rejected the traditional family <coughs> model insofar the traditional family model was based on authority, right? With a husband, a father figure, the leader of the family, and the enforcer together with the wife and the mother of rules within the family. So it was not simply the rejection of the natural concept of the family. It was more the objections raised against a family model based on rules, right? Rules and roles. Actually, well, roles there, but both uh, are, are true, right? Where your role is defined by a set of rules and practices. Within society, the global counterculture insisted on the rejection of career and success as lifetime goals. Okay, this is not something that can give sense, meaning to life in the culture of global counterculture. Success is somewhat replaced because this is something that starts developing during the 1960s and gets practically to our century. Success is somewhat replaced by the idea that being famous is a good proxy for success. But we're talking about being famous not because of any particular achievement or any achievement that is particularly pragmatic. I've done something. It's more creative success, right? And therefore, the models of success during the 1960s compared to previous eras be become for example, the actors, actresses, the singers, right? And from, for, for, from, from this point of view, the most uh, egregious kind of model for the period that leads to 1966, the year of men and women, and 1967, Bonnie and Clyde, would be the Beatles, right? Which were a huge success, and again, it's not like they were the first stars born out of music. Their success and their social traction was significantly different, especially among young people. So to be famous can then also be translated when you look at the bottom of society, at those looking up at, the, at these media stars, in I want to be like these famous characters. I want to be like the Beatles. I want to be like the actors I see in movies that represent an alternative kind of culture, which explains also the success that Bonnie and Clyde had among the younger moviegoers, right? So, Success is defined by fame, and fame is not linked to a social achievement such as I changed society, or I changed the economy, or I did something big, uh, a mausoleum, a church, a bridge. Those would be the achievements of the past, and I want to be recognized. Right. Rejecting a career is also rejecting the idea that life should be based on a plan or a project. Meaning that I'm on, on, on a linear trajectory towards something. That I'm working through school or I'm working through the earliest part of my career towards a, some kind of grandiose plan or project. One plan, one project. One plan that I follow, one project that I want to accomplish. This is rejected by counterculture. And of course, uh, then we will be looking at these three films, but a lot of films from the period, 
have the same kind of themes. The best example from the same period, 1967, would be Easy Rider with Peter Fonda. If you haven't seen it, it's quite an interesting film uh, to look at. But if you want, even if you consider Il Sorpasso, this idea that a, a, a plan or a project for life doesn't work is reflected within the character of Roberto, right? Roberto has been given by his family a clear role, go to Rome, right, because his family lives in Rieti outside of Rome, study, study law, come back, open a law practice in your small town and become successful within that specific context. But Roberto himself doesn't believe in that because he's so easily tempted by Bruno, the guy with a sport car, sports car, and then so easily converted by him that clearly, it, it's clear that the role given to him by the family, the plan given to him by family, the recipe for success is exterior, right? It's extrinsic, it's not his intrinsic motivation in life, right? Otherwise, he wouldn't sway, he wouldn't deviate so quickly. And when he dies, you can say, this is the death of, of that kind of life model. Of course, as I alluded to before, counterculture is strongly against following rules, especially, again, not rules in general, the same way that I said, the counterculture doesn't reject family as a natural institution. Uh, but the idea that there are ether, eternal rules, that there are stable, permanent rules that should be followed rather than rules that emerge from a specific context, okay? Because it, it would be <coughs> naive to think, for example, that in the social communes of the hippie movement around the world, you don't find rules. In fact, you find a lot of rules. And to this day, uh, groups that are trying to follow that model have a lot of rules, but they emerge from within, right? They're not applied from outside or from some kind of superior moral, religious, political authority. So <coughs> against rules, against authority, again, the idea that there is some kind of formal authority at the top of society or the top of the family that decides what you have to do. And again, not going into the complexity of the somewhat weak alternative plans developed during this period, we can just say that there is a general strong desire to be different, and the difference is usually expressed, manifested, in terms of creativity. And which is, which is why during the 1960s, fashion becomes more important in society, especially in the younger population, as a way to identify yourself as different. Different because you dress significantly differently from your father and your mother. And you go against the rules they impose on you, or the role, right? A kid going to school, a high schooler, should be uh, dressing in a certain way, etc. Not dressing as an adult, you cannot behave like an adult, go out, stay out late, uh, etc. Okay? I was born in 1963, I had a sister who was seven years older than me, so I lived through the agitation, the turbulence of that in my own family, right? resisting the uh, encouragement and the or the imposition to follow a certain fashion code, okay? So, how are these films representative of counterculture? Let's look at the five parameters that I've identified, and for each, I will say a few things about a man and a woman, Bonnie and Clyde, and to lay blacked up, I place them in this order because that's the chronological order, 1966, 1967, 1971. And 
1970-1968 is the crucial year for the counterculture movement. So one thing that makes these films exemplary, useful for the understanding of counterculture is their rejection of linearity, right? And, and you see the connection, it's easy to see the connection between the rejection of linearity and this set of ideas, right? So none of these films really has a crescendo, right? It's not like there is a narrative tension that leads somewhere. Yes, it is true that in Bonnie and Clyde, the characters eventually will die, but it's clear that Bonnie and Clyde is not a tragedy. A tragedy has a linear arc, right? At the beginning of a tragedy, think of the Greek tragedies, the classical Greek tragedies, or think of Shakespeare's tragedies. You have a character who has to pay, for lack of a better term, for their sins, for their shortcoming, which might have been unintentional. The hero of tragedy might not be guilty on, of anything. Take Hamlet, right? It's not like Hamlet has done something, but he carries with him the seed of the tragedy, which is Hamlet's inability to take charge to act, to take responsibility for the situation that he finds around him, which is not primarily responsible for. And you find linearity in comedies because at the end of a comedy, you, you have a happy ending. You have a happy resolution of some kind of bogus minimal issue, right? And you find linearity in a drama right, in terms of, in this case, really a crescendo of tension. You don't find that linearity. The linearity is broken in every one of these films. In A Man and a Woman, there is no clear linear development of the characters. Uh, for example, in terms of continuity, you don't know much about the characters and their lives before the film. Yes, later on you will learn, like the same way that you learn at the beginning of the film, that uh, Jean-Louis has a son in a boarding school, is a widower. Uh, you, you learn that Anne has a daughter in a boarding school because she is a widow. They both lost their spouses, so you learn something about the material circumstances of their situation, but you don't know how they got there, really, right? Uh, so there is a lack of, a clear lack of continuity from that point of view. The same way you don't know anything about those characters past the final scene when they meet again at the train station in Paris, and he goes there, uh, she doesn't expect him to be there, and this is the first time he does something romantic on his own, really, without her specifying directly or indirectly, be there, do something, I've done this, step up. No. Uh, but you don't know anything about them. There is no, they don't even add just a few frames to see them celebrating their marriage in a church or living in a house with their kids. Nothing. There is no happily ever after clearly marked, shown in the film. And in fact, when you look at the sequel from 1986, A Man and a Woman 20 Years Later, you learn from the characters in the sequel that they separated briefly shortly after that reunion, that romantic reunion and embrace and hug at the train station because they're uh, romantic love could not be sustained, right? Because that was not the beginning of a real love story. It was just a series of romantic episodes. The same is true for Bonnie and Clyde. You don't know anything about them before the first scene, where you see her naked 
in a hot bedroom upstairs in Texas and unhappy with her life, caged within her uh, existence, her job as a waitress, unsatisfied. And he shows up under her window, looking into a car. Maybe he wants to steal the car. Maybe he doesn't. But like every other action by Clyde, he's always undecisive, right? He's always looking, trying, but not really decisively <coughs> acting. That's how they get together. That's how the story begins. You don't know anything about their trajectory before that time. And, of course, there is no after for them because they die. But is tragedy the culmination of uh, their love or their criminal career? Not really, because what you find is an episodic description of their story, right? You find a few episodes in their story, but there is no sense of any development by the end of the movie, even though finally... Uh, Clyde has engaged in sex with her is not any more of a man any more mature any stronger any more decisive than, that, than he was at the beginning of the film and she, Bonnie has developed in some ways but mostly she's become aware of her talent and her talents have found a venue through the publication of her poetry and both have become famous but it's not like you see them working towards that goal in the same way that you see characters in films from the 1930s, 40s, 50s you know, develop okay? and to Lane Blacktop, same thing you don't know much of anything about the main characters, the driver and the mechanic before they enter the scene, other than they're on the road and they're engaged in uh, illegal uh, street racing for money, right? And they move from place to place. Do you know anything about them? Nothing. In fact, the, the film itself burns in front of you. They vanish. They disappear. And their life does not develop in any linear form because they just go from place to place and even when they engage in a race right so you may think now I have the twist now I have something to support a narrative development because I have uh, the two characters that have to get to Washington DC before GTO so that they will win GTO's car and that car may become their next car because their Chevy 55 is kind of old and uh, will not be winning races for them uh, for too long. This, this, this apparent uh, challenge, this apparent goal dissipates in front of you. In a few scenes, they're not racing each other. They're supporting each other, right? When GTO has problems with the police, they stop there. When GTO has to uh, uh, get some sleep, they wait for him. When he has problems with his car, they are the ones saying, you have problems with your engine, we need to fix uh, the carburetor. When they could have easily said, okay, he will have problems, he will have to sleep, we will get to Washington DC and win the car, right? Same with the character of the girl, where there is the hint of a romance, but no plan for the future, right? No real project of any future together. So there is no trace, no evidence of a traditional linearity followed in the narrative developments, in the narrative arcs of the films. So lack of continuity, an episodic kind of narrative, which later on will become typical of films, especially during the 1970s, and no crescendo. Let's, let's examine the representation of sex in those films. All those films are, uh, um, share the same lack of emphasis on sex. Virtually no sex is there, right? 
In a man and a woman, they try to consummate sex finally after he joins her after the race, after she has sent him the uh, daring telegram saying, bravo, I love you, and he drives all the way to Paris, and then from Paris to Deauville, they spend the day together with the kids, finally they get to the hotel, and they have sex, but sex uh, is interrupted, because she realizes that the memories of her uh, past husband are stronger than whatever he has done for her, because after all, when, when you consider what Jean-Louis has done, Jean-Louis has simply responded to her input, right? She sends the telegram saying, I love you. So she makes the first move. And he feels, and you hear that from his words when he's driving back, he feels that he has to respond, right? When he's driving back to Paris during the night, he says, when a woman like this makes such a gesture, you have to respond, you have to act, right? Saying, it doesn't matter what I feel, I have to behave the way, the romantic way she wants me to behave, right? So, in a way, if you compare, no matter how poetic and fantastic the representation of Pierre, the husband, is, if you compare Pierre and Jean-Louis, Pierre is always a romantic hero from morning to night, right? Always on horses, etc. And Jean-Louis is, even though he's a race driver, a car tester, he's a rather dull, boring guy. And once in a while, he tries to uh, do something uh, more impressive, right? But his, his, his life is not really like that. Of course, Bonnie and Clyde don't have sex through the film, fail to have sex through the film until the very end, and when they finally do, it's not like this is a culmination of their love, right? Because, as I said, look at how Clyde reacts after the sex. Did I dwell? And, and she says, yeah, you, you were perfect. And, and um, his childish is not like having sex has changed him into a virile, uh, masculine, uh, leader uh, or, or hero, right? And the only reason really they have sex is that they're about to die. Because without that sex, their death would not be tragic enough, right? Because this has to be added to one of the elements. Now they're famous, finally, they're close to each other, they appreciate each other's values. He had to has told her, you did something for me, you made me into a hero, you made me famous. And, and then you add sex to that, meaning finally they're happy, this makes their ending, their sudden death, more tragic. Just that. It's not like sex is a big thing in the film. And for Tulane Blacktop, same thing. There is one sex scene uh, where the driver is outside the room, of a motel and inside the girl and the mechanic are having sex. So it's very indirect, you hear the noises and you know what sex means for the driver, right? It's a failure for him because he's naively, romantically in love with the girl, fell in love when she saw her, yet he's not able to do much about it. And the only thing that he will do is have this awkward conversation about cic cicadas uh, sitting on a fence uh, outside of a gas station and even she says, well, this is not much, <laughs> right? And he has to walk away and fail. So rejection of sex has to be seen, the representation of sex, this, this somewhat weird representation of sex, has to be seen in the context of the culture uh, the, that uh, we, we can define the counterculture as a rejection of traditional models of Love, meaning not, again, a rejection of sex itself, but rejection of sex just within the context of the couple. And of course, uh, I should have added to the list of uh, elements that the global counterculture is famous for, I should have added sexual freedom, right? Using a term and label that was introduced by 
the philosophers of and the practitioners of the counterculture, right? Not that it was really liberating uh, sexual promiscuity was though a big thing, right? So sex has to be liberated from the couple, right? It's not within marriage, it's not just within one couple, etc. So this representation of sex in these films is one way to approach that idea. Another thing that these three films share is the fact that they have a different, non-traditional male lead, a softer kind of guy, a less masculine kind of guy, where the masculinity of the character is challenged or even overwhelmed by the female lead, right? And, and therefore, you kind of softer kind of guy. Again, think of Jean-Louis, right? He, he's not such a strong guy. Think of Clyde, and it's not just his uh, uh, refusal to engage in sex, but in general, his soft attitude is not a heroic criminal at all, right? He's acting, even when he goes into a bank, he's acting like a tough guy. And take Tulane Blacktop, the driver, or even GTO, they are not traditional masculine uh, characters. The driver doesn't show much leadership at all. And GTO shows a kind of leadership that is theatrical, right? Because he's not achieving anything. He's not on a path to any kind of success, any kind of uh, career, right? And all of these main leads are subordinate to the female lead or something else. Right? In a man and a woman, clearly, as I said before, Jean-Louis does this great romantic gesture of driving a thousand miles to see her because, in a way, she has initiated this. And so he's following her lead. And the only thing she do he does on his own is to decide, after he has left her at the station in Deauville, to drive to Paris quickly and get there before the train. All the while, on the train, she is rethinking her story. And she has decided that the story could have a future. So even there, his leadership is being challenged. Who's deciding that they should get together, right? In um, Tulane Blacktop, the driver and the mechanic are not really subordinated to, submissive to the girl. In this case, they're subordinate to the car. I would say, right? They're serving the car. They're appendixes of the car. Appendices of the car. They, they are uh, linked to the car. They are serving the engine, the well-being of the car, and the car is their whole life, right? They need money for the car, not for themselves. Let's look at the treatment of death. What's common to these films is the fact that death is represented in a strange way. It's a sp spurious element, meaning that it's not integrated well within the narrative of the film, right? It's this strong element, strident. It is strident. Clearly, you cannot ignore it, but you cannot make sense of it either. In A Man and a Woman, death is represented through the cinematic death of Pierre de Stadman, and then the even more cinematic representation of the events that led to the suicide of Valerie. Okay? Both are episodes that are hard to account within the context of the story, right? They don't seem normal, not even within the fictional uh, reality of the film itself. In Bonnie and Clyde, death breaks whatever linearity the style has. Because in, in some ways, in many ways, Bonnie and Clyde is a comedy, right? Think of the music. Think of the rhythm. Sometimes it feels like slapstick comedy. And that is the word, the label that was used at least by one of the critics in the reviews that I posted, slapstick comedy. 
I used another term suggestive of a comedy based on rhythm, which is vaudeville. Vaudeville was a theatrical genre very popular in Europe and the US between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, where the rhythm dictate the comedy, right? The, the, the pace at which you see things happening. But then this comedy is broken by the immediacy of the violence, right? The second bank robbery with C.W., Bonnie, and Clyde doesn't go well, but it's, it doesn't go well in a comedic way because C.W. has parked the car and he's trapped in between cars and he's trying to get out with this big old car. So that's not really drama. But then, a few seconds later, a bank employee jumps on the car and Clyde shoots through the glass into the face of this guy. And you see the splatter of the blood, which was different, more dramatic for the viewers of the time who were not used to, to this. Okay, There is a Tarantino-esque uh, vibe, but simply because Tarantino studied the films of the 1960s and 70s and tried to reproduce the dissonance of the combination of stylistic elements in the film. Think of Pulp Fiction or think of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and how many different genres are mixed in there and how sometimes the moving from one aspect to another, take the ending of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where uh, the, the woman is burned to a crisp with a flamethrower. Nothing before that prepares you for the, the, the violence, right, of, uh, of, of that. And uh, to Lane Blacktop, there is no death unless you want to interpret the conclusion where the film burns as an allusion, as a hint, as an indication that the only way their story can end is through some kind of accident during one of uh, the races. And however you interpret that, there is some kind of existentially, existential ennui, existential drama in the film. So the sense of that is there indirectly. And harmony, I put there, harmony meaning are the various elements in the films tied together stylistically in some way that works? No. There is no uh, attempt to reproduce any kind of stylistic harmony. Everything is based on dissonance in these films, right? And you, we know, we've discussed how different styles, you go from the representation of a family lunch to uh, uh, the, the very theatrical narrative of the death of Valerie. How do they combined together. There is no attempt uh, to do so. Same with Bonnie and Clyde, which is part comedy, part drama, part tragedy, if you will, right? But it's also everything focused on them, right? Uh, everything is, uh, the whole film is focusing on the man and the woman in Lelouch's film, Everything is focused on the driver, the mechanic, the girl, and GTO in Tulane Blacktop. Even in Bonnie and Clyde, you see them all the time, almost all the time, with the exception of when they go into a bank to rob. And one scene that I'm planning to show you, if I have time, when the people from the camp, from the Depression Era camp, come around their car to pay homage to them, to admire them, to acknowledge that they are now famous, yet they're unconscious. So there is no attempt to uh, expand the view of the film into society because these films are not uh, following the same traditional models. OK, that is enough for now. So let me uh, uh, prep the screen. And I want to show you a couple of scenes hoping that after this introduction, you'll be able to see uh, the film differently. Okay, we have to wait for this to warm up.
In the meanwhile, we can lower the shades, please, in the back. We have about 10 seconds for the projector to warm up. Okay. Now, this is the continuation of the scene that we watched on Monday. After meeting with the farmer who has lost his house to the bank and uh, having the farmer and his black assistant shoot at the house as a sign of opposition, resistance to the public authority of the bank, Bonnie and Clyde will introduce themselves to the farmer and uh, they will, Clyde will declare we're bank robbers, right? The same way that he said uh, the same formula he used the first time with Bonnie to just to tell, I'm a man, I'm a true man, I rob banks. And then we have to see him, right? We have to put him to the test. And he goes to rob a bank in the next scene, and he fails completely because he does, it's not, he, the character is not built on traditional models of masculinity. Success is not there for him. He will become famous. It doesn't mean that he's successful. So he goes back to the car, and she's laughing at him. She's laughing at what happened. She's laughing at him. And then the next scene I want to show you, she recruits CW. So he's not enough of a man, doesn't want to have sex. He's not enough of a criminal, cannot rob banks. And therefore, they need another man. And notice that she recruits CW with Clyde's assistant, but it's Bonnie who gets another man because clearly Clyde is not up to it. He's not manly enough for their criminal activity or any other activity they want to engage on. See, so those are the two scenes that we're going to watch following the conclusion of this one. If there is time, I'll show you when the people gather around them at the end of the film.